Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about um, research methods in the social sciences. So let's get started on that. Uh, here we go. Okay. So um, social science research methods uh, is not something that's covered in your textbook, but um, I feel like it's very important that we cover this. So um, let's just get started. Okay. So um, why is research in social science important? Um, I think that the most important things are that um, if we don't have a research base to what it is that we do, we are not really knowing what is an effective intervention um, because there's, no, there's not been any evaluation of it. There's not been any examination of how well something is working or not working. Um, and also we don't know how what we're doing is impacting people differently. So we don't know if we're being consistent, if we're, if we're delivering things in a consistent manner, and we don't know if we're delivering them in a way that um, is appropriate for everyone. So that's the, the equity issue type thing. Um, the, the worker bias is similar, um, is, is really an equity issue, that's sort of the same thing, but I feel like it's important to, to remember that, you know, workers are people, and there is bias wherever there are people, and it's important when we, um, when we deliver a service that is evidence-based, that we make sure that we adhere to whatever that evidence says that we should be doing. Um, because that allows us to um, avoid as much bias as possible. Um, lastly, and maybe like most importantly in a global sense, you know, the, it might be a soft science, right? But, but social sciences are still sciences and we can still apply the scientific method to them. Okay, so um, there are some, important research considerations. And there are entire classes, entire programs, entire degrees that are devoted to basically what's on this slide right now. But um, there, there are three kind of things that I feel like are really important for us to discuss right, right this second. And they are um, validity, which is internal and external. So internal validity is, are you measuring what you think you are? And does it really, um, does does the, the thing that you think is the cause, is it really the cause of whatever it is that you're measuring? So we're talking about independent and dependent variables when we talk about that. Um, and external validity. So can you feasibly apply this conclusion to, to, to the real world? This is something that, that if you find it in the lab, do you know that that's going to, to also be found in, in the real world? Um, which is a little different than relevance, right? Like that's not quite the same thing because even if you find that it does apply to the real world, like is that something that really makes a difference or not? Like I'm sure that we've all seen in the media every so often we'll see something and, and it'll be like research has found that, you know, cats with, you know, dark fur and cats with white fur, you know, have, have slightly different, you know, metabolization rates of you know, calories. Does that matter? <laughs> like, is that really like super important? And it's not really. So, so like relevance, that's what relevance is. And it's not the same thing as external validity. Um, so avoiding bias, um, there are two types of main bias. There's respondent bias. So those are the subjects and then there's researcher bias and those are the experimenters. And there's a lot of different types of, of bias for both of these. But um, for our conversation today, I think the most important two are confirmation bias and culture bias. Confirmation bias is, is really about um, kind of taking into account evidence that supports your previously held beliefs as the researcher and kind of discounting whatever it is that you're gathering that, um, that doesn't support your beliefs. Um, this is one of the most uh, important and one of the most difficult forms of bias to deal with. 
And then there's cultural bias, which is um, kind of interpreting results through the lens of your own cultural context. And to a certain extent, you can't really avoid that, but it is, um, it's really important to be aware of so that you can mitigate it as much as possible. Okay, so the bottom line here is, um, research and practice, evidence-based practice should be the cornerstone of what we do because it leads us to interventions that are effective and valid and replicable. So, you know, where oh, if you do them over here in Texas and you do them over here in California, that you can replicate that and relevant, you know, like it's just as important that you can do all of those things as it is that it like actually matters and makes a difference that, you know, matters, right? So let's talk a little bit very, very briefly about research types. And again, there's entire classes, entire degrees that are devoted to different research types. So I don't want um, you to take this and, and run too far with it because this is just an extremely brief overview. Okay. So um, research falls into basically three categories that apply to us. Um, experimental, which is exactly what you're picturing in your head when you think of research. Observational, which is, you know, like basically what you see, you record and then analyze. And then participatory, which um, a lot of people don't even know really exists. And, and basically participatory research um, is focused on creating results that, that you can turn into action. So whatever it is that you find in your participatory um, research, the goal is, is to make a change, right? And the way that you do this is, you know, you have a researcher or somebody who has, you know, a background in, in doing science and like the scientific method and doing research. And then you get them together with a group of folks who have an issue or a problem or something that they want to work on probably in their community or in their organization or something. And then um, they work out a research question and then they work out like a methodology for how they're going to answer that together in partnership. And then at the same time that you are working with these folks, you are also going to be studying them, right? So they are the ones that are providing the data. So what does that look like in practice? Um, basically, so let's say that you have an organization that you're studying, you get together with the leaders of the organization and some of the members of the organization, you figure out what it is that, that they want to focus on and work on. And then when you, when you move forward to the stage of data collection, you are working with those same people. So basically the experimenters, the, the scientists, the researchers are the, are also the subjects. Okay, so um, this is the gold standard. So this is like experimental controlled randomized trials are um, what, what you really want to have if you wanna be able to maximize your internal validity, right? So that was, remember we're talking about this A measure B, right? And um, it, it's, it's very good if you do it correctly for doing that. So, so making sure that you're measuring what you think that you're measuring and there's not some like random invisible, we call it a third variable that is, that is impacting what it is that you're studying, right? Um, it's not always as good, although it can be on external validity. So it can't, it's not always as good to take something that you know is true in the lab and be like, oh, this is also true in the real world. It's not that simple. So like it can be a little, a little complicated in that way. Um, also, you know, doing experiments can often be very expensive, you know, and it's not always um, simple to do in the sense that sometimes if you have a complex question or a question that isn't really about something that can be quantified, it can be really quite difficult to do a controlled and randomized trial. Um, but, you know, this, this is the best way to, to
to, again, establish that A causes B. So if that's the thing that is most important to you, what you really want is a controlled randomized trial. Okay, so surveys. Um, everybody's done a survey. You've all done surveys um, and you know what they look like, right? There's usually a scale from one to 10, from one to seven, whatever, it's called the Likert scale. Um, and you you pick a number and you know that all those numbers go into the analysis and then you kind of sort it out from there, right? And um, it can be very simple to kind of figure out what, uh, what the answers to your research questions are from surveys, but they're not perfect, right? Because, you know, there's all of this bias in um, in respondents to, to surveys because you know you want to get the answer right you want to give them what they need and it um it can really mess up the results sometimes so surveys are not perfect um and also you know if you want to get really good depth to to your answers that can also be difficult because um, surveys are really best designed for things that you can put on that Likert scale, right? On that one to 10 scale. They're not great at, at you know, in, in large numbers at things where people are putting in um, comments, right? It's very difficult to um, go to that extra step and kind of like sort through those comments and figure out what it is that, that, um, that people are saying that, that all sort into the same bucket. Okay, so case studies, a little, um, a little like um, just looking at one person's story, you know, like taking a taking a look at um, a particular example of something. Um, it it can be really good for things that are really rare and for taking a really like deep look at something. Um, they they can be really good at demonstrating how a theory works in the real world or debunking a theory um, about that that is existing in the real world. But by definition, right, we're talking about one one case or something. Um, they're very difficult to generalize, right? So you can't you can't take it and apply it to the world necessarily, right? You have to. You have to understand that um, oftentimes your case study is not going to have a lot of um, applicability. Okay, so ethnographic research is a little bit like case studies in the sense that you have, you know, somebody who goes in and experiences something in particular, and they their job is to just kind of make sure that um, that they're getting something from their point of view that is valid. Um, that researcher lives within that culture for a period of time, they're collecting data. And again, this also has point of view limitations in the same way that case studies do, um, because you're only getting that one view. Oh, also I wanna talk a little bit about cultural competence here. So sometimes um, in ethnographic research, you can get a little too confident in, what, in the data that you've gathered and believe that you now have cultural competence. And we've, we've talked about that, right? Like cultural competence is a bit of a myth. You, um, you can be at risk of, of losing your cultural humility and ethnographic research. So single system design, this is a little bit complicated to understand, but I'm gonna try and simplify it. Basically, you are measuring the same um, group or individual over a period of time, and you're not changing them. There's no control group. You are, you are changing the circumstances. So, you know, if you are measuring, you know, how many hours um, a particular office group works, first before you do anything you just kind of measure what it is that they're doing already and then maybe you move their computers around and then you measure that and then maybe you take their coffee away and then you measure that and you see what it is that you do that that has the biggest impacts on what they do um okay so needs assessment um so this isn't this is a slightly different um 
a way of looking at research, but basically what it does is it utilizes those research techniques that we've already talked about to determine what needs require attention in an organization or community. And it's often paired with program development work and um, later program evaluation. Oh, I went back, sorry. Um, program evaluation does exactly what you think it does. It an analyzes a particular program for effectiveness and it can use any type of research methodology. Um, you know, all of those ones that we've already talked about that's appropriate. And the goal is to identify what, what needs to get worked on, right? So um, the career outlook for social services, um, you know, for you guys really, um, is basically consulting, right? So there are plenty of consulting firms. I've worked at one um, in, in the Bay Area that do this kind of work. So if you're really interested in doing this kind of work, there are definitely jobs out there for you. All right, there's some sources there. And again, if you have any questions, you know what to do. All right, thank you, bye-bye.